Tihaniwashite, buenas tardes, good afternoon. My name is uh, Tomas Tonatiu Dominguez Lopez. My mother is Water Woman Sharon Dominguez, and my father is Sundance Chief uh, Tomas Lopez Sr. I identify as Chicano. I pay homage to my uh, Diné, my Apache, and my uh, Mexica Otomi um, Aztec Empire roots. I was raised with the Chichango Oyate, so I uh, also identify as uh, Junca Chichango Oyate, uh, which is where Frank Juan is from as well. My family is from Rosebud, South Dakota. I am raised, was born and raised in Denver, Colorado, um, and I was growing up. I was very much surrounded by um, the Chicano and the American Indian Rights Movement. My parents played um, small roles in both of those movements um, with Corky Gonzalez. Um, and uh, Chief Leonard Trodog, uh, Leonard Peltier, Carter Camp, and um, Russell Means, which are just some of the American Indian Movement um, leaders of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, my story personally starts uh, in Wounded Knee in, in 1973. And um, when my parents, my mom specifically, uh, was asked to take supplies to the people who were at Wounded Knee. Um, and who in here knows what Wounded Knee is? A few of us. So, Wounded Knee uh, in the 1800s was a major massacre that uh, the U.S. government committed on the uh, indigenous people in South Dakota. Hundred years later, um, the Chichangoyate and some other uh, Lakota people came together and began to speak out against the tyranny that was happening on the police forces that were on the reservations. Um, and also the, the treatment on behalf of the government towards the people on reservations. So they had about a month um, standoff with the FBI in which one FBI member was killed. They didn't know who killed the FBI member. And so naturally they took um, what America calls its only prisoner of war, which is um, Leonard Peltier. Leonard Peltier is still imprisoned to this day. He is seeing the last days of his life and we are currently trying our hardest to have the U.S. government release him so that he can spend the remainder of his days on his reservation with his family. So fast forward however many years into the future. It's May 2016, and I'm graduating from college. I recently got my bachelor's degree in technical communications and Native American studies. So I graduate, right? And during this time, I'm also hearing about this small group of indigenous youth and women that are coming together in North Dakota against this pipeline. I heard about these youth that ran from North Dakota all the way to Washington, D.C. to deliver a message to President Obama asking him to keep the promise that he made to the people and the kids of the San Rock Sioux tribe in 2014 when he made his visit. He promised to do everything in his power to protect these youth, that he would do everything in his power to ensure that we had what we needed to be who we are. Just one of the many promises that was not kept by the U.S. government. So they went all the way back to remind him of that promise that he made. In May, I really didn't know who I was, to be honest. I really didn't know what direction I wanted to go in. I knew that I had just gotten a degree in something and that I was now a part of this special league of people that was so educated, right? I knew that I was native, I knew that I was indigenous, you know, when I'd go home I'd put on my regalia and when I left I would put on a different so that everyone else accepted me. Because oftentimes for indigenous people, when we step into a space dressed like this, we are not accepted. We are immediately pushed to the side. I'd rather call myself Thomas than Tomas. So I'm over here looking for all these jobs. Can't find a job. And I finally, August is one of our biggest ceremonies. It's our new year. It's called Sundance. So I go and I meet all of my, not me, I see all my family that I see every year. And they're telling me 
Nephew, are you going down to Standing Rock? You gotta go down to Standing Rock. They're down there trying to fight the Dakota Access Pipeline. You gotta go see them. And I'm just like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not a pro. You know, I'm not an activist. Y'all know that. I'm not a <laughs> and they're like, oh, you talk a lot, nephew. You should go have some fun with your cousins. Well, at that time, my grandfather, or my uncle, was, was dying. Um, my uncle Richard was a man that instilled my sense of adventure in me. He was, um, he was in the army, and he would always, when we were younger, he would always tell me these stories about his, his adventures and the battles that he was in, the craziness. And after he died, I realized that I think I think this is a sign. I think this is my great adventure that I need to go on. So I asked my parents, you know, what 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 should I do? I don't just want to go up there, like, you know. And my dad was like, well, first of all, you can just go up there because you are a chief's son and you have every right to go up there. He was like, but I agree. I don't want you just going up there and doing it and not taking anything. That's not what we teach people to do when you come into somewhere and you are kind of uninvited in a way, you bring something to the table and you offer that. So my dad said, on behalf of our Native American church, yes, please come in, come in. On behalf of our Native American church, we want you to take these supplies. So I took an entire truck bed full of supplies, firewood, suffered fried bread, cigarettes, Tobacco, anything that I felt people really needed, stuff that I know my people love, you know. And I get up there, and um, immediately upon arriving, you can feel the vibrations in the ground. It's one of the something I just can't explain. Sometimes I'd never felt anything like that in my entire life. For the first time, I could just be me. For the first time, I would enter into a space and I would disappear because I was in a room full of people that looked just like me. I'd never experienced that in my life. Every room I'd ever been in was always me and a group of white people and of course, a few token black people. And I was used to that. So for the first time, I found myself literally being able to just blend right in. And it was beautiful. What was supposed to be a three-day trip turned into two weeks. I met the International Indigenous Youth Council about a week into their, their popping up out of the ground. And I fell in love with them. My cousins were already a part of it, and they were like, dude, we need you here. You are great, we love you, you're so articulate, and you know, people really, really like you. And I was like, oh, you know guys, I'm not an activist. Like, I'm not an activist. And they're like, okay, whatever. So I have to come home, because I have responsibilities back home. And um, I come home, I lose my job, the small little retail job I was working. And I started just working for the IYC. Um, trying to get them firewood, any kind of donations, just kind of being a middleman between the city and the camps. So, I'm sitting there on November 27th. I wake up and I have the very unfortunate pleasure of having to watch half of the youth council be brutalized and arrested on live stream Facebook. I broke down, I cried, I was hurt. All this historic trauma just began to pour out of me, like I'd felt it all before, I'd seen it all before, it was nothing new. Even though physically I hadn't seen anything like that before, I knew that it was nothing new. So I went to my parents, asked for their blessing, and within two days I was living in San Diego. My brother and my dad drove me up because they wanted to make sure that I was safe. We took a we took a big cord of wood to everybody, 
And then he dropped me off. And before my dad left, he looked at me and he was, just told me, you have to be ready for what you may or may not see. I love you, son. And if you want me to come back, I will come back like that and pick you up. My father and my mother have always been very supportive of whatever it is that I do. As a gay man, they've been there for me my entire life. Never judged me, never asked anything of that of me. And always told me that they, I could call them at any point and they would answer them. They would answer them. So at first, once again, I was not an activist still. I really just wanted to be at the back lines. I didn't want to be at the front lines. I was afraid of getting maced. I was afraid of getting hurt by the police. I have my own personal experiences with police that made me very skeptical of even getting close to police officers. I get very anxious being in a room if there's even a security guard that remotely looks like a police officer. So I'm living in camp, and a lot of these pictures that you'll see are, are of us at actions at the front lines. Um, and Standing Rock was such a unique place because even though it was all of these native tribes, over 350 native tribes came together, it was everyone. We had our Asian brothers and sisters. We had our black brothers and sisters. We had our South American and Central American brothers and sisters. Canadian, Dutch, English, French, every walk of life coming together to support humanity. Prior to Standing Rock, if I were to go into a room and say, me, be chummy, nobody would have known what I was saying. Now, I walk into a room and I say, Mini Uchoni, and everybody responds with, water is life. In Spanish, I always see that. In German, my place. We learned all of these ways that, at the end of the day, humans need water. The level of inclusivity in camp was beautiful. Two-spirit, transgender, Every religion, every walk of life was accepted. And what we really tried to instill for everybody was that no matter what you are, no matter what ability, no matter your, your physical capability, you have a place in the community and your role is just as important. From the chiefs to the children, everyone plays a very intricate role in our community. Something that oftentimes in Western culture we forget. So I began to talk to everybody about what they'd experienced. On my, my first couple of days, I realized that what my brothers and sisters had experienced on November 27th, which was the raid of our North Camp, was possibly one of the most traumatic, disgusting things that could have happened to anybody. Little did we know that things were going to get much, much worse. They arrested our brothers and sisters, they ripped down our TVs. They pulled people out of sweat lodges. They broke our chanupas. They took our feathers. And then after all of that, they zip tied everybody so tight that people's fingers went numb. And they left everybody out there on a freezing day, some people in their underwear, soaked from the sweat lodge for hours. They finally took everybody to a few different camps, a few different jails. They shoved them all in dog kennels, and they wrote numbers on their arms to identify them because they were no longer people. They were caged animals that needed to be stopped. The last time I know of people being referred to as numbers that were written on their bodies was during the Jewish Holocaust. And I say the Jewish Holocaust because that is the only Holocaust that is really spoken of and is actually called a Holocaust. But we forget there was an African Holocaust, there was a Native Holocaust, and there is still an indigenous Holocaust going on to this day. This war, the Indian Wars never ended. They say that the war on indigenous people ended after, you know, after this, 
the 1800s. It's over. You're good. People don't even realize that in America, indigenous people were not considered human beings until 1940s. We were. If you look at a lot of indigenous people's birth certificates, it says that they're either white or they're Latino. Because it was better to be white or Mexican than to be an animal Indian. So all this historical trauma starts to come forward. Even, even some of my white brothers and sisters who were arrested, some trauma began to come forward. I remember my first action. I thought I was just going to be on the back lines. But then you see your people being maced and beaten. You see women and children and grandmas being thrown to the ground. And you think that you would just stand to the back, but it doesn't work that way. You run to the front because it's people like me who can take the mace. I can take the beating. I can take the, the tasing. I can do all of it. I cannot let my grandmother do that. But the most disturbing thing about the first, my first action was seeing the smiles on the faces of these men as they walked by slowly with their mace guns, just macing us in their face, so happy that they could do this to us. That was the most disturbing thing I saw on that day. What people don't realize is that the Dakota Access Pipeline resistance was led by our women and our youth. It was so beautiful to see so many women finally taking back their power and bringing this feminine energy forward to share with everybody explaining to people that, you know what, this masculine era that we've been living in time is going, is here to rise and has nothing to do with male, female, has everything to do with the energies that we both, that we all have. And me as a man, I have both a feminine and a masculine energy in me because I am both my mother and my father. So this picture right here, is one of my favorites because the people of California, they actually canoed all the way from California to North Dakota. And they came in their traditional canoes rowing. People came from Arizona, uh, South Dakota, um, New Mexico. And when they came, they brought their traditional dances to us. Dances that had never been seen in public, that only these tribes see, they came and they brought it to us and they said, this is how we mend ties. This is how we put aside anything. The Crow and the Lakota came together, which is for the first time, they are enemy tribes and they put aside their differences for this one thing. It was beautiful. I miss it every single day of my life. It's November 20th, um, winter had already come. In North Dakota, uh, the winters can get uh, negative 60. This particular night, it was about negative 20, maybe negative 30. We had actually, the youth council had been brought to a, the table of ma decision making, excuse me a little, cluster. For the first time in Native American history, and most history, we have, youth actually had a spot at a political table where we could make decisions. And not just because they wanted to even out the playing field and have a diverse panel. No, they brought us to the table because they genuinely respected what the youth had think. What was it that you bring to the table? Because we have these ideas as elders that we've been putting into manifestation for so many years to get the same result each time. And what we would explain to people was sometimes the most important lessons in life can be learned from a baby. Unconditional love. Self-love. 
A baby loves himself so much, they'll stick their feet in their mouth. <laughs> So they bring us to this table, and we, every, anytime there was an action, it had to be approved with the youth council. I mean, we would go to actions, and literally people would come up to us, is this approved by the youth council? Because if it's not, I'm leaving. <laughs> we actually, what really brought us to the table is, after a very, very violent action one day, the youth council decided to come together. We went camp to camp, early, early in the morning before the sun had come up. And we, we told everybody about the silent action that we were gonna do. We asked everybody to come in their regalia, with their chanupas, with their prayer ties, with anything that they felt is they use in their everyday spiritual life to bring it. But the one thing we are not going to use in this is our voice. Because sometimes when you speak, things aren't heard. And sometimes the best, you can, best, best thing you can say is nothing. Not because we were trying to say, don't speak out, or we don't have a voice, but because what we were trying to do was demonstrate our people's level of discipline. We were showing them how powerful we were. We didn't have to say a word. We didn't have to scream. We didn't have to shout. We simply showed up. And we brought water to the police officers that had brutalized us for the past few months. We took, they drank it. We walked right past the line, the do not cross line, where they said they would shoot if you crossed it. And we crossed it. We went right up to that barricade. We took a virgin because when we do our major ceremonies, we always put that purity first and she holds that water. That water always comes first in anything that we do. So when you look at Standing Rock, a lot of things come into play because that water is so central in everything that we do, it becomes a social issue, a political issue, an economic issue, an environmental issue, it becomes so many things. So the Youth Council was brought to the forefront of all of this. They said that we were the spear point of the spear that would kill the black snake. And the prophecy was that the, from Sitting Bull was that the seventh generation of the world would come together would rise and would stop all of these oppressive forces that were keeping humanity down. We're living in the seventh generation, so we were living out this prophecy. So like I said, it's November 20th, freezing out. All of this commotion begins to happen at the bridge where we had done this ceremony. And we hadn't approved anything. We had no idea what was going on. Hordes of people were running towards the bridge to see what was happening, and when we went over there, we realized that they were having a major standoff. They shot rubber bullets at us, which a rubber bullet is just a real bullet with a piece of foam on it. They were using flash grenades. They were using smoke bombs, they were using tear gas, and they were macing us. But the worst thing about this night was that they used the very water that we were protecting against us in negative 20 degree weather in the middle of the night they began to spray us with water hoses people lost eyes people lost arms people walked away with major head injuries People broke bones, people had seizures, people went into cardiac arrest, severe hypothermia. A few of our youth council members had gotten shot. One of them had was seizing and they'd asked me to get to the medic's tent immediately. And what I saw in that medic's area, I will never forget in my life. People with frozen blood icicles on their faces, medics screaming, we have a bleeder, take them to the bleeders. People with holes in their heads, just drip, drenched in blood. 
people that were so gone in their mind of what they'd just seen that it was as if they were just staring at a wall. I didn't sleep that night. The last explosion stopped at about 4.45. And the next day I went into town because they said that there was an action. And I didn't want another action because our people had seen too much. So I went into town. And I started, they asked me to pray because our existence is our resistance. So when we go to these things, we pray, we take our regalia, we sing, we dance because we want them to know we are here. The action ends up being very peaceful, very beautiful. And then when I end the ceremony, they ask me to pray again. Deputy Kirchmeyer rolls up in a police car, gets out of his car, points at me and says, arrest him. In the middle of my prayer, which is something very private and very sacred to me, I was violated. I was kicked to the ground. And I was told that if I don't quit resisting, they will arrest everybody. And they are not afraid to use live ammunition. So in that very moment, I asked myself, what would Martin Luther King do? What would my grandpa Crowdog do? What would my dad do? What would my mom do? My mom and dad never taught me how to fight. I had to go to the streets to learn that. My parents taught me how to pray. And I knew that for the past 500 years, we have been giving our oppressors exactly what they want. And this day, for me, that ends. And so, I finished my prayer. And in my head, the proverb came into my mind that no matter which way the wind howls, the mountain will never back to you. In my trainings as, as a sun dancer, my, my grandpa Crowdog and my dad would always tell me, Son, you have to focus. You have to focus. You have to let go of everything that you're thinking of, and you have to focus. Be like a rock. Like a rock, okay, whatever, right? And in that very moment, handcuffed and zip tied, humiliated in front of everybody, violated in something that was very sacred to me, I stood like a rock. And I understood exactly what they told me. We had a small victory in December when the easement for the Dakota Access Pipeline was stopped by the Army Corps of Engineers. They could no longer drill under the Missouri River. So we celebrated, except the Youth Council. We knew something wasn't right. We'd been lied to too many times by the US government, and we knew that something wasn't right. Everybody went home, except for I would say about 600, maybe 1,000 people stayed in camp. And as soon as Donald Trump was put into office, he made an executive order to continue the Dakota Access Pipeline and also reopen the Keystone XL Pipeline. The Dakota Access Pipeline, as of right now, has oil running through it. And in some ways, we feel defeated. We feel like we lost. But just because we've lost this battle doesn't mean that we have lost the war. It's just begun. As of this past week, energy our energy transfer partners, excuse me, which has bought the Dakota Access Pipeline, lost $6.7 billion in stock. And on top of that, the divestment campaign that we have started has divested over six billion in the Dakota Access Pipeline as well. We've divested from banks. We've divested from corporations that support them. And we're showing these people that you are not gonna do this again. We're hitting them where it really hurts because these people don't speak language, they speak money. So we'll hit them where it hurts if that's what you wanna do. We've won so much more as indigenous people. We've united indigenous people of the world.
to stand up for what they believe in, to be proud of who we are, to go out in our regalia and not be afraid of being judged or what people are going to say, to stand up and fight back. We reminded the world that Black Lives Matter, women deserve rights of their, over their body. The LGBTQ plus community has power and children have something to bring to the table. I know who I am now. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know that behind me and behind every single one of us is a million ancestors just waiting to support us. All of the answers are there. It's in our blood. It's in our heart. It's in our mind. It's in our soul. A year ago, I thought I was going to be a broadcast journalist, talking about entertainment, meeting celebrities. <laughs> and now, I realize that I am the son of Water Woman, Sharon Dominguez. And I am the son of Sundance Chief, Tomas Lopez Sr. And I am the grandson of Chief of Chiefs, Leonard Krodov. I know that I'm here to stand up for my people, and I know that I may die never seeing the fruits of my labor. <clears throat> but what we are doing is not for us. It's for the next seven generations and the legacy that we're leaving behind for them. You don't want them to look back at us and say, my ancestors didn't stick up for me. They didn't care about us. They let it happen. You want them to look back on us and say, they stood up for us. They stopped it. And they made the world that we're living in that much of a better place. Thank you all so much for allowing me to be here to speak to you today and share my small story with you. My story is just one of thousands. I ha unfortunately, I can't show you one of the videos that I usually show people, but I would like for you all to go watch it. It's an ABC special called Meet the Youth Behind the Standing Rock Protest. In that video, you'll meet my other brothers and sisters that helped fight the Dakota Access Pipeline. A lot of us that left camp are still dealing with severe PTSD. And one thing I want to tell anybody that's an activist is to please put self-help first. Because if there's one thing we learned at Standing Rock, it's that we didn't take care of ourselves like the way we should have. If any of you know anybody that's ever gone through any of this, please just remember, be an open ear to them. Hug them. Listen to them. Because some of us just want to be heard. We want to be seen. And we're going to be seen. We're human beings. We're not Pocahontas. We're not your fairy tales. We're not your footnote on a paper or your chapter in a history book. We are beautiful people just like you. My name is Joni. I hope you're back here. I say thank you for listening to me today. Thank you. 
where all you can write out the ground like my own or it is not. And so I'm apologizing for my part and my back three more. So I'm happy I'm going to do what I wish to Oh, hi, thanks for being here with us. Um, my question is, I wanted to, to uh, learn whether you had connections to other organizations in South America, uh, for example, in Brazil. Um, just because we, we, we had it recently the visit of the Cacique Lá de Verón from the Guarani Caiuas, from South Amazon, Mato Grosso, do Sul. And I'm very keen, I'm connected to them, so I'm very keen to put you together and see whether we can make a global um, resi resistance team. Yes, absolutely. So right now, like what I am doing and what I've taken on, so the IYC was a grassroots organization. We literally just popped out of the ground in Standing Rock. And all it was was literally four of my brothers and sisters that were sick of being ignored around a fire with like some little wood stumps. And, and, and that's, that's what it was. Um, many of you may have heard the name Jacelyn Charger. Um, she, uh, was, she's the original founder of the IIYC. Actually, one quote that she said to me that was really the reason why I went to Standing Rock, why I moved there, because this, that what she said to me just moved me in a way that was so profound, is she said, who better to speak for the past than the voice of the future. I, I get goosebumps just saying it, honestly. Like, I, I remember it so vividly. And so what I've done after leaving Standing Rock is start to really um, create a lasting, um, strong organizational structure and foundation for the IIYC. So that as we, who are youth now, begin to get older and phase into another stage of life, this organization can stand on its own and still support the youth that are here. So we are currently trying, we have the Indigenous Youth Council down, we're trying to add that international part. So we've been talking to people in Canada and in Mexico, and then uh, last night I met some people from Bolivia, and I would absolutely love to speak to you about, about getting in touch with anybody um, that has um, indigenous ties to other countries, um, specifically youth, um, to start talking to them. Yes, because like the prophecy said, it, it's, it's the youth that are going to come together and put aside all of these differences, put aside all of the petty bullshit, and move the world forward. We, so yes, I would love to speak to you later about that because that is something that we're doing and that is something that I personally am very passionate about. And I see the resistance in Brasil and it makes me, that feels good. You know, I'm seeing all these resistances pop up and if people would start allowing the indigenous people to step forward and lead these, to allowing the, our African American, our, our our black brothers and sisters to lead these, these marginalized communities to step forward, that's where that power is going to come from. That's where it's going to start. And so I would love to speak to you after more. Anyone else? Any questions? <clears throat> Is there something like this? <laughs> yes, I, I, I definitely consider myself an activist now. Um, no, no, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> you know what? I, I think that that word, in a way, is, is, is a load of crap because the, I'm doing what all of us need to be doing. I'm not doing anything that is like so out of the ordinary and is like something that, no, I'm doing what everybody should be doing. We should all be speak. If you're not outraged about what's going on in the world right now, you something is wrong. <laughs> okay, we should all be doing this. This is not, you know, people may, like the mainstream media kept naming this an indigenous problem, an indigenous, no, this is not an indigenous problem. This is a human issue because once the water is gone, we are gone. And people, the thing about humanity and humans is that we think that we have won over Mother Earth. 
but what we don't realize is we are parasites on a host, and when that host is ready to expel us, it will. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, is there anything we can do? I mean, I'm just a student in London, but obviously, like, what are your recommendations to, like, help us out? Um, love this question. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I usually get the, the question is usually, how can we as white people help? That's my favorite, really. Um, so this is what I, this is what I tell my, our white allies. Thank you. First off, thank you so much for even showing up. There's a lot of white people that don't wanna know, they have no interest in knowing, and they live in an ignorant world where it's them and that's all. So thank you for even asking that question and being here today. What I would say, the way that you can help here in, in, in like across the seas from America is do your own research on what the indigenous cultures that are here and understand that before European colonization and oppression happened in other continents, it happened here. So when I talk about tr historical trauma and the trauma that's in our blood memory, you have it in your blood memory. As many, I don't know if men, I mean, I'm sure you do, but the witch burnings that happened, that was, that was an ethnic cleansing. That was a colonization of this world. And that historical trauma is in each and every one of you. You remember it. You may not remember it here, but you remember it here. That type of behavior is not natural for human beings. It's learned. Just like sexual trauma is learned, domestic violence is learned. None of these things are natural to us. We have to learn it. So by doing your own research into your own what's who you are, you can better understand why we as indigenous people are doing the things that we're doing. More specifically to my, the, uh, my white cisgendered men, <coughs> you have over anybody else a privilege and a platform that I as a brown man as a brown gay man, will never have in my life, no matter how hard I work for it, no matter what I do, no matter how much money I make. You are born with this natural pedestal and platform. So because of that, when you, if and when you go into these spaces that are usually POC-led, what you have to do is step down from that platform and allow people of color or allow these, gen or these marginalized communities and these marginalized people to step forward onto that platform and use your privilege to, for them to say their message. And it seems like a really difficult thing in a way. But I give the best example, there was a, I call him Mountain Man Kevin. Kyle? Kevin. Kevin, Mountain Man Kevin. <laughs> he was up there, I would say, for six months of, of Standing Rock, and he would open his, li literally all of his live streams got thousands of viewers. He had thousands of followers. Like, this man was just social media savvy. <laughs> so what he would do with his live streams is he would start it with him and say, Hi, my name is Mountain Man Kevin. I know you all love me. I am not important and he would switch it. And he used his platform to let indigenous people speak and let indigenous people lead and let indigenous people tell the story from our perspective, not from his. He made it very clear. My perspective is not what's important. The people's perspective is what's important. So he used his privilege. He used the platform that he has to, give, to allow our voice to bleed forward. And also, if you as the people of the UK want to lead an action, one of the biggest things I can ask you to do is ask your government and your churches to give the indigenous people of the Americas back the belongings, the ancestors, and the remains of our people that they have stolen and continue to keep. That's healing, 
and that's something that not only will we as indigenous people heal from, but you as people of this world will also heal from, because you're holding on to something that is bringing you down, and you are not letting it go. So giving back the remains of Pocahontas and the thousands of other indigenous people that were brought here is a start. Uh, is there a question? Yeah. Um, what, what do you think is kind of the most uh, important part of an effective action, you know, that gets change? Um, Nonviolence. Nonviolence is key right now because the thing is, is they're trying. These governments and these oppressive forces are trying to dehumanize us as much as possible. So when we come to these actions, and you, you, it, I don't care who it is, what color action the, the issue, you're gonna have people that are angry, and they are gonna wanna, they are gonna wanna show that anger because we're sick of not being heard. And so what you can do, and what the International Indigenous Youth Council was, this is what we were really big on, is when people are getting like that, and they're shouting, and they're pissed, and they're saying, fuck you, and fuck the poly. You go to them, and you say, brother, sister, you hug them. You don't push them out, you bring them in. And you say, you have to focus. Focus. Be like that rock that these grandpas are talking about. Stand like a mountain. Mountains don't holler at people, they stand. We have to stand in solidarity with each other. So for me personally, when going to these actions, we have to be together, we have to be one. And sometimes that means, you know, taking the people who are the most hurt and loving them and reminding them why you're there, the purpose of why you're there and that Fighting this fire with more fire is just going to create a bigger fire. But bringing water to that fire will put out the fire and also allow new life to grow. Um, but to see that the indigenous fashion come forward is it, it, crazy. And um, from indigenous people actually creating this fashion, you know, is, 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 um, it's, it's really, really beautiful and like also allowing people to support indigenous artists because uh, like I, I found out that here in the UK you can be an artist and apply for grants and you can actually like pay yourself and well in America if you're an artist you are dirt poor and you maybe make a thousand dollars a month. Still like, huh? It's still big. <laughs> okay, okay. Well they don't give you grants, that's for sure. Um, and so yeah, just I, I think that um, it's really cool because when you people are seeing this music, this art, this culture, and then they're supporting indigenous indigenous work, and also eventually supporting the communities that we're trying to support. So. I've set up on Facebook, um, which if I can speak to any other people here, it's, it's plain words of be the change. Um, Sub called rhyme the change, and hence it's focusing on. You know, poetry music, that's yeah. stuff that's up in this world and bit of the oh. There's a group called Climbing Poetry. They're really, really awesome and they supported us a lot while we were in Standing Rock. We actually did a concert with them. Mm -hmm. that's pretty awesome. Anyone? I have a question. Um, so this word like healing has been coming up quite a lot, and, you know, the issue of taking care of yourself on the front line. I'm just wondering, well, actually, there's so many questions and thoughts came to my mind, but I've been watching a lot of the hip hop music that's been coming out just as well and kind of recognizing that, you know, there's like this incredibly enormous generational trauma that, you know, the indigenous people are living through and maybe for some people it's not fully processed and there's like so much healing to be done there. And I, I, I'm, I'm interested in like, to what extent the Native American churches able to help with that with the traditional, in the traditional ceremonies and what extent people are accessing that and also wondering about and um, also the other gentlemen back in Brazil are wondering about the some of the you know indigenous um, healing traditions that there are in South America and you know what's the scope for using these traditions to 
you know, it's difficult to actually process this trauma that maybe the lot of people don't even acknowledge or even, you know, like conscious yeah. in their minds. Yeah, no, um, you're right. Like, there's a very, there are there are people who are privileged, like me, to have very traditional um, elders in my life that I have access. There, I was raised with sweat lodge in my backyard. I've been praying this way. Like, I know that anytime I need something, it's right there. But there are a lot of native people and youth that don't have that. They're raised in the city, or they're raised in a very modern way they're they know gang violence they know alcohol they know drugs and, and and that's what they're raised in and so what was very beautiful about standing rock was that you had those two groups of people coming together so the people who really needed healing were meeting the people who could offer that healing um, my brother alex goodcane milk is one of those examples he would always tell me, I really don't know anything about who I am. I want to see that. I'd like to go. And so now he's going into Sweat Lodge. He's learning about what Sundance is. He's finding about, out about the Inipis and the Uipis and the different ceremonies that we're having. So it's being addressed. It's really, the thing is, is finding, the pe finding a way to market that. Oh my god, that's a terrible way to say that. Um, <laughs> And to really let other indigenous people know that didn't go to Standing Rock, there's healing available. And the vet, like, you know, you know, you go to doctors. I just recently did a, a, a speech in front of a, a, a group of medical students where I actually told them, you know, sometimes you're not always right. <laughs> and, um, you're not always right, and uh, there's not a pill for everything. And sometimes your pills and your medications actually do a lot more harm to the person than actually helping them. And instead of laughing at us when we bring up things like sweat lodge and ceremonies, maybe what you should do is bring yourself down a little bit and see the indigenous person for who they are. And so letting all of the indigenous people know that it's out there if you want it. So, and then, uh, was that a second part of your question? I don't think so. As far as South America, I, I don't know much about the about. But there is the Vedic healers who were at Standing Rock are currently in the process where they're trying to get a clinic that is native to Indian people that um, is looking at all the various different types of indigenous healing mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. to be made available in that clinic. Mm -hmm. So and, and they're not sure yet that they're mm -hmm. likely to be based at Standing Rock. Mm -hmm. I have a suggestion since we're all here, and we know that trauma is existing in not just the Indian population but all around, and we just will be carrying it. We could actually just now close our eyes for a few seconds, a few minutes, and just send healing, send a holding. Imagine yourself hugging, holding, and just caring for someone else. Is that a good idea? I mean, I'm I'm done with just, I, I mean, what we just watched and kind of talked about is pretty heavy. So I'm done to maybe just close our eyes and take a deep breath. Yeah. And kind of just breathe in mm -hmm. some good stuff and kind of let go of anything that we're all dealing with. And I'm done. I love doing stuff like that. So I'll close our eyes. In our language, a home that here I say means we're all related. So we say that at the end of our prayers in case we forget anything. Um, one more question? Oh, I, I've got one, but 
Does anybody else have a question? Yeah, go. Um, Hi, my name is Angela. I'm part of the Virginia Pier here in London, UK. And something that, that I struggle a lot inside the movement here in the UK is being tokenized. I'm just wondering how, how you feel about it. And being what? Being tokenized. Being a token instead of Oh, tokenized. Um. I guess it's just the way you live it. You are the majority in the movement. But here in the UK, we are the minority. So it's very, it's very, it's, it feels, sometimes you feel like that way a lot. We are definitely not the majority in America. Mm -hmm. We are, yeah, I absolutely struggle with that. I've struggled with that my whole life. Um, growing up, I was told a lot, um, oh, we're really lucky to have you because you just bring us so much funding. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> like, like, I went to an art school that was predominantly white, where my choir teacher never failed to remind me to bring the, the, the choir I was a part of money, and how proud he was that I bring them money. And like, it wasn't like, oh, you're so talented and we accept you because you're so talented. It was like, we accepted you because we need at least a 1% native population here, and like, we get a pretty good chunk of money because of that 1%. And so, um, I, yeah, I absolutely understand what you mean. Um, I just think reminding people that you are not the token native in the room and that they need to pipe down on that real quick or you can just leave <laughs> is like really important and like and really just uh, reminding like you know our white brothers and sisters that you know even though you know you have a voice too it's okay to step to the back of the room it's okay to you know not be at the forefront in front because this as much as it's our, it's everyone's fight, it's really important to make sure that these marginalized communities are being put at the forefront because we're the ones that at the end of the day, all of this oppression, all of this terrible energy falls on our shoulders and we're kicked to the side. And so for me, it's, I'm just, I'm, I'm just not putting up with it anymore. You will be told something. I will, I'm not afraid to, to say something to you, you don't scare me anymore. And I, I'm, not a, I'm not a child. And I deserve the respect that any person, any person deserves. And just because I'm not dressed like you, and just because I don't do my hair like you, and just because I don't speak in the same language as you, or pray to the same deities or God as, gods as you, does not mean that I'm less than. And so that's, like, I think it's a hard struggle that we go through, and I know that it's not easily dealt with, and there is no definitive answer on how to stop the tokenization of us, but for me, it, it, the way I stop it and the way I put a halt to it is I, I, I do use my voice and I speak out against it. And, and sometimes I'll, I'll go as far as, do you, would you like me to make you feel uncomfortable for being white? Because I can. <laughs> you know, and, and, and in a way it seems funny, it seems funny and it, 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 it sucks that, I, that we have to do that. It's absolutely ludicrous that we have to go to those extents, but sometimes we do. But it's also a matter of not being at dis doing it in a disrespectful way. For example, when I go to these festivals and I see these people in these headdresses, you know, and they're Part of me wants to go up to them, snatch it off, and go off, and start using every obscenity in the book, but then I have to remember, wait, how, can I, how is becoming my oppressor while trying to find my liberation making anything any better? So I have to go to these people, I have to, I have to calm down, <laughs> I have to go to these people and I have to explain to them, look, what you're wearing right now is literally a symbol of the oppression and slavery and ethnic cleansing and genocide of a people that has been going on for over 250, oh, excuse me, over a thousand years, I'm sure. And you are simply perpetuating all of that. And you're not making natives look any type of way. You're making yourself and your culture the ignorance that indigenous people think about you. And so it's really a matter of how can we like how can we not do it in a way where we're becoming our oppressor? Okay, so this is a question from Ali, who's worked on getting this organized okay. as well. 
along with Dumin and Matt, um, she can't be here today. So she says, how are Native American people coping with the virtual lack of governmental support of indigenous issues concerning the environment and land? And she goes on to make a statement, I believe during Obama's administration, the US saw its largest pipeline, ex uh, pipeline expansion ever. During the election campaign, Obama and Clinton seemed conspicuous in the, for their silence on standing up. Jill Stein being the only one who comes through in real solidarity, and Trump certainly doesn't look like he cares. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that the way that... Okay, so one thing that I've noticed in the many communities after standing around is people are really starting to look at self-sustainability and the idea of weaning ourselves off of this fossil fuel addiction that we've created. And um, it's, it, you know, it's just like any addiction or any addiction problem, it's, it's not going to be an overnight thing. We have to take baby steps. And those baby steps include things like not using plastic water bottles that we just drink and throw away. Or, you know, if you can walk, walk. Or if you can ride a bike, ride a bike. Don't ride your car. Um, and then going farther into that, creating community gardens and teaching people how to cultivate their own food and um, letting them get their hands in that soil and recreating that relationship with the earth that we've lost. Um, especially in like our larger cities like London, I'm sure, you know, a lot of the youth here probably have no idea what it's like to garden like that and to grow their own vegetables and to, to plant their own seeds and to harvest that. And, you know, sometimes your plants die and you learn a, you learn a valuable lesson on what you did with that. Um, another thing that like we, when we were in Standing Rock, we lived off of solar energy. And we lived fine. I charged my phone every day. Like, it was not an issue. And, you know, I, at one point, I'm pretty sure one of the girls was, like, curling her hair. And I was like, <laughs> right? Like, it was, it was really interesting to, to see that. And, like, um, I think a lot of indigenous communities are really starting to look into our, our alternatives, into um, solar energy, wind energy, water energy, all these other things that we can do. But we do understand that tomorrow we are not going to stop using cars. It's just, it's unrealistic. And so I think self-sustainability within the indigenous communities is goes into healing. We're learning how to heal through that but also goes into understanding that this government isn't gonna, isn't gonna make things better for us. They're gonna continue giving us processed cheese and processed milk and processed meat that is terrible for us. It is literally giving us cancer, it's literally killing us. And what we're saying is, you know what, maybe we don't need the government to help us. Maybe we never did need the government to help us. Maybe the government was never helping us to begin with, but we're actually pushing us down and making us dependent on them. Mm -hmm. And so this education is very new to us. And so that's how I've seen a lot of, not a lot, a couple of indigenous communities um, uh, dealing with that issue. I know that there are a couple um, of projects going on that they're planning that by like, I think 2020 or 2025, every reservation, every major reservation in the US will be run on solar energy. Um, they're working on that. That's not, uh, like I said, that may not even be a realistic time frame even, um, but that's something that they're looking at. Did that answer the question? Kind of. Kind of. Oh, yeah. We can touch it up to it. And as far as, I'm not going to lie, when it comes to all the Paul, I don't trust none of them, so. <laughs> <laughs> Jill, Jill Stein, many of them. <laughs> so I have a quick question. Was there any indigenous representation at Standing Rock? from European, uh, uh, um, European peoples, probably Sami. Yes, there was. There were, there were um, a few Celtic people there that um, they did bring a very specific ceremony. And um, they also, were, they, I think they did like an, like an apology ceremony in a way for like the things that, that the European kind of government has done, even though they were like, it's not us that did it. Um, mm -hmm. The Sami? Huh? I don't know. Um, I think there's like an Irish. Um, yeah, I think they were Irish. And I actually missed that ceremony. Uh, I don't remember what I was doing. But they, I remember they were like, people came running and they were like, there's the Irish Celtic people here. Oh my god, they're doing a ceremony up there. And I was like, 
Interesting. That's cool. Like, it's really awesome. I know we had Palestinian people there. We had, um, I, we had um, some African people come. We had, oh god, we had so many, de we had some Japanese people come. Are you? I need people. The, the Maori people came, um, the Hawaiian people came, and all of them brought their sacred dances and their sacred yeah, ceremonies. Yeah, and Hawaiian came in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, yeah. Go on, Max. Um, so there's, there's a question about like social media. Um, with like two parts, I guess the first is do you feel like social media has had like any significant benefits on like allowing people to vocalize or mobilize or criticize or just kind of in a less political sense just kind of like share knowledge and information about certain cultures between the people and then also do you feel like it's had any kind of side effects on mental health in certain communities? Um, yeah, so I think uh, social media allowed for the rising of indigenous media. And that's really important because for the first time we're telling our story from our point of view instead of allowing our story to be told from what they call the victor's point of view. And so social media allowed for that. Indigenous rising media came out of social media. And you know, you see people like Dallas Goldtooth, Aaron Wise, um, myself, and a, a few of the Sacred Stone camp. <laughs> Kennedy, Kennedy Warhol, um, who used social media, and, and if it weren't for social media, people would not have seen what happened at North Ray. They would not have seen what happened on the night of Backwater Bridge. The, the, the picture that you see of me up here being arrested, you know, I've never gone viral in my life. <laughs> and of course, the worst moment of my life, I go viral. <laughs> and so, and so, then that segues me into the mental health issue part of it, you know? Um, we're trying to explain to people that if they're going to be posting things that may have any type of frontline action to put a warning at the beginning of it saying if you are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and have not yet been dealing with it, there are graphic images in this and you may not want to watch it. Um, I experienced this firsthand when I was invited to Canada to watch the premiere of Viceland Rise. I watched, pretty much relived my experience about a month after I left camp and I was supposed to speak at the end and couldn't. I was in the bathroom punching walls and cracking because I had completely lost my shit and that's the moment that I realized, holy crap, I have a lot of stuff that I'm not dealing with. I was ignoring every sign and everything that was pointing to obvious PTSD and mental health issues and and see not you know not admitting that and then going and watching that I could have I, I, I was at the point where I was seeing blood and I wanted to hurt somebody for some reason and it was it was just it was it was not good so social media can have that effect on people and I know that me personally my PTSD it is and I, I shouldn't compare because it's not suffering Olympics, but um, I feel like I, I didn't experience some of the brutality that a lot of other people did. For example, my sister had her hand broken twice by the same police officer in the same week. <gasps> and so, um, like, and, 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 you know, youth suicide is something that we are dealing with as well, and it has gotten a little bit worse. In the Youth Council, we have had four um, suicide attempts since January. And, um, you know, luckily they do have this network where we can help them, but there's a lot of people who went to camp and left without that network. And so, um, yeah, the social media thing, if you're going to be posting videos about it, it's okay and it's good, but maybe just to put a small warning at the beginning for those water protectors who were there, that if they can't handle that, that they probably shouldn't watch it.